Good morning, church. Welcome to this beautiful sunny day. A little chilly outside, but it's getting warmer, right? Getting warmer every day, and spring is just around the corner. And also just around the corner is Easter and Holy Week, and there's announcements in your bulletin about what's going to be taking place on Holy Week. But to get us ready for that, uh, next Sunday after church, we'll be filling those plastic Easter eggs with candy for our Easter egg hunt on Easter morning. So bring in your candy and also pre be prepared to stay a little bit afterwards to help fill those eggs next week. Also, we're taking orders for Easter lilies. So if you'd like to have an Easter lily designated in honor or memory of some, please uh, fill out that form and get it to our church office. A couple other items uh, today. Uh, it's not in the bulletin, but uh, later on in the service, actually, uh, these blankets were tied uh, by many of you, and they're going to be donated to the children's home, United Methodist Children's Home. So we're going to have a prayer over these blankets, and our blessings will go with these blankets to the children who will be warmed by them. And also, finally, uh, two things happened in our church yesterday, which is sort of related to what we're going to do after the service, that the uh, Franklin Baseball League had their draft uh, yesterday, and they distributed uniforms and all that stuff. That was in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we had the uh, Michigan Flute Orchestra had a concert here. Well, the baseball league had a whole bunch of food left over from their gathering, so they donated it to us. So if you don't have any lunch plans, after the service, go to Cyril's Hall. There's macaroni and cheese, there's salad, there's sandwiches. So all kinds of food left over, and they're for us. So feel free after the service to enjoy a, a lunch in Cyril's Hall. And then for the flute concert, we took a special offering, and part of that offering went for an organization called Hungry for Music. And it's an organization that takes in used musical instruments, and they refurbish the instruments and give those instruments to children whose families necessarily can't afford to buy or lease an instrument, but are still wanting to play a flute or a violin or whatever musical instrument. So it's a great organization. And we're collecting donations for that organization. We did it at the concert yesterday, but then in Cyril's Hall, there'll be a basket. If you'd like to contribute to Hungry for Music, there'll be an opportunity for you to do so. So that will all take place during our fellowship time after the service. But we're here in God's house to be God's children, to worship and praise God. But I invite us now to stand and let's greet each other in Christian love. remain standing for the call to worship. We'll read it responsively. We have encountered the word calling us unto communion with God and with each other. And calling us into discipleship to carry on Christ's work in our world. So we come together here joining hands in the great quest to worship God to love each other and to serve the world.
please be seated. Now it's time for the children's message and Dr. Althea. Thank you. I invite the children to come forward now. Oh, it's an all girl power moment. Good morning, ladies. Guess what? I have a cup full of goodies. I do. And guess who they're for? Me. All for me. I'm not going to share. I don't like sharing. Don't hiss at me. They're booing me because I don't like sharing. Is not sharing a bad thing, girls? Let me show you what I have that I'm not going to share. Candy. Lots and lots of candy. But I'm a grown-up. I don't have to share. Hmm. What do you guys think about that? Is that nice of me not to want to share? No. I should know better, right? If I have something and I have enough, I should do what with it? Should I share it? And what does sharing exactly mean? So does that mean I should give you guys a chance to pick something out of my cup? Maggie, you like that idea? Yeah, Maggie's on board for that idea. That's what sharing means. It means to give of what you have. How many of you are good sharers? Uh-oh. See? No pretense here. Katie and Maggie are like, we are not good sharers. <laughs> well, sharing is an important thing that we as believers in Christ do. Because Jesus, when he lived among us, one of the things that he showed us how to do very well is to share. And today, you're going to hear about the last time that he shared with his disciples as they sat and they had a Passover meal together. He showed them what it means to share your love with someone. And you know how he does that? In a very special way. Well, there are a number of things that he does that are very special, but one of the things he did was he washed their feet. Now, some of you are making faces. But sharing out of yourselves and being humble is what sharing's all about. So even though I wouldn't eat this candy anyway, it still is a big deal that I care about you guys enough, I love you guys enough to share out of my cup with you. Just like Jesus loved us enough to share him whole, his whole self with us. And we'll talk about what that means. So you can take one and pass it along. And we share because we love. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. And his, example and his example of sharing, of sharing and, giving and giving of ourselves. Of ourselves. Bless, us Bless us as we learn to share, we learn to share the, love the love that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen ladies. All right. All
let's be Irish for just one more day. The church and believers in Ireland have blessed us with many wonderful prayers since the early 5th century when many came to have faith in Jesus Christ. St. Patrick is regarded as the founder of Christianity in Ireland and helped inspire many of these popular Irish blessings and prayers. These prayers are filled with words of hope and faith in God's promise for every day. I hope you will find yourself filled with joy and feeling life's burdens fall off your shoulders as you hear some of them. Let us pray. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. And may love and laughter light your days and warm your hearts in home. May good and faithful friends be yours wherever you may roam. May peace and plenty bless you with joy that endures. May all life's passing seasons bring the best to you and yours. Also, may God give with every storm a rainbow, with every tear a smile, with every case a promise, and with every problem life sends, a faithful friend to share it, and an answer to each prayer. Another one. May there always be work for your hands to do. May your purses always hold a coin or two. May God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you. And last, from St. Patrick's shield, Christ be with me. Christ be before me, Christ be behind me, Christ be in me, Christ be beneath me, Christ be above me, Christ be on my right side, Christ be on my left side, Christ be where I lie, where I sit, where I arise, Christ be in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ be in the mouth of every man who speaks of me. <clears throat> Christ be in every eye that sees me. Christ be in the ear that hears me. Now let us be in silent prayer that we all have. O oh, gracious and loving God, as we continue praying to you this morning, we give you thanks for so many blessings and opportunities we have to share those blessings with others. And in front of us in the church, we have these blankets whose ends were tied by some of us gathered here and others in our church family. These blankets, will, again, will go to the children's home to provide warmth. And we know warmth comes in a variety of ways. There's the warmth from the cold, and certainly in these bitter cold days, we are mindful of those less fortunate, those that are out in the cold trying to stay warm and safe. And we're thankful for many ministries that provide care and comfort for these, uh, the least of them. But also there's the comfort, the warmth, to know that you are loved and, and, and cared for. And we just pray for those that are feeling lonely and afraid that 
in your own way, warmth and comfort can come to know, to come to them so that they will know in their hearts, their spirits, that they truly are never alone, that there's people praying for them and your arms are surrounding them always with your loving care. So bless these blankets and be with those who eventually will receive them, that they will receive the comfort of your care and of our prayers. And as we pray, we also lift up the needs of our world where so many are hurting and suffering. Whether it's close by or far away, there's just too many to count. But oh Lord, we pray in your own way, your own powerful way, that comfort and care, food and healing and safety can come to all of your children, not just here in the United States, but around the world. So continue to use us as a blessing that we can make our part of the world a much better place. See, these are the prayers of your people, and we share them to you in Christ's name. And as we end this time of prayer, we once again join our voices together as we humbly pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we continue our worship, it's time for the presentation of our offerings. And I invite our ushers now to come and receive our gifts. Uh, before I play the offertory, I just want to give you a brief history of the song London Derriere. Uh, it's named for the county. Uh, in Ireland that it was popular, it was very popular in there. It was submitted in 1855 for publication in the Melodies of Ireland by Jane Ross, who lived in Limavady, which was in Londonderry County. And of course, the most popular tune that people know are the, the words that are set to this song are Oh Danny Boy. Um, however, it's also been used for love songs, hymns, um, and there are actually quite a few hymns you can find this set for. So you'll, you'll know the song when you hear it.
world. scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, for this season of Lent, we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, and to help us think about what we believe in various affirmations of faith, we've been sharing several of these that are found in the back of the hymnal. So we share the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and this morning, I invite us to share together a statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. It's on page 883 but it'll also be on the screen. So let's join together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. 
in life and death and life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I invite us to pause in a moment of prayer. And now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, many years ago when I was in seminary, I was learning all kinds of theological words and concepts. And amongst us seminarians, we circulated a paraphrase of the scripture lesson that you heard read this morning. Now, after the fact, I found out that this paraphrase actually began in the late 60s and early 70s, but it still resonated with us seminarians in the 80s. So this is the paraphrase. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the eschatological manifestation of the ground of our being, the kerygma of which we find ultimate meaning in our interpersonal relationships. And Jesus said, what? <laughs> That's what seminary does to you. It gives all these concepts in our minds. Well, friends, over the season of Lent, we've been looking at what we believe Using the Apostles' Creed as a starting point, we're exploring our faith so that if Jesus were to ask us, who do you say that I am, we would be able to answer him. So, so far, we've looked at God, the creator of heaven's earth. We looked at Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And last week, Althea shared about the Holy Spirit. So today we continue with the part that comes after the part of the Holy Spirit, and that is, I believe, in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Now, in our reading this morning, after Jesus confesses, or Peter confesses Jesus to be the Savior, the Son of the living God, Jesus states, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So there you have Jesus actually using the word church in scripture. Now the Greek word that Jesus uses is ekklesia. And ekklesia literally means to be called out, to be, to be gathered as a people called together. And what's interesting with this word that Jesus used, ekklesia, it wasn't a religious word. It just meant a group of people joined together. You could have a religious ekklesia, you could have a civic ecclesia. You could have an athletic ecclesia, just a group of people joined together. But what made Jesus' use of the word so unique, though, is he, he said, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. So, friends, the Christian community is a, a Christian church is a community assembly of those that belong to Christ. And that connection to Christ is what makes the church holy. Now that word holy, when you, when you hear that word, what do you think of? Like when I hear the word holy, I think it means something or someone that's especially religious. That's what it means to be holy. You're some way connected to God in a very special way. But that's not the way it's used in the creed. That in the creed, holy implies belonging to the Lord. That's what holy means, belonging to the Lord. Adam Hamilton, though, he writes this. Among the challenges that many churches struggle with are issues of control. Who is in charge? Sometimes pastors act as though the church belongs to them. Sometimes denominations act as though the church belongs to them. Some church leaders or staff are longtime members. The patriarchs and matrix of the church believe or at least act like the church belongs to them, but the church belongs to the Lord. And as the church, we are called to discern what Christ's will is and to be about that mission. At its best, I believe that the church is a community of acceptance, love, and support. And though we often think of a building, right, when we think of the church, that's the people and not the structure that is the church. 
In fact, as we move into the future, I think there'll be more and more faith communities. They'll be meeting in places that do not look like a church as we know it. Now, why is that going to happen? Well, one reason is the decreasing size of congregations and the increasing costs of maintaining a building. As we know, fewer and fewer people are attending worship, right? Or joining churches, especially amongst our young adults. These folks feel that one does not need to belong to a church, that one can be spiritual, but not religious, that they appreciate and respect Jesus, but they don't feel that they have to be together with other Christians. Now, there's a lot of reasons why our young people feel that way, and I'm not really going to go into those this morning, but let us say that in order to reach out to our young people, to the millennials and others, then we, we have to listen to what their concerns are, what are their critiques, and also to find out what are the needs of our young people, what are they looking for, and how can we address that? And again, reminding that the church isn't about them, the young people, it's not about us, it's about Christ. That's what the church is about. But I believe there's something about Christ that will resonate with our young people. Because one thing about the church is that we are the body of Christ. That the church is the continuing presence of Jesus in the world. In fact, when Jesus left this world 2,000 years ago, he gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples to continue his work. His ministry of saving, of healing, of teaching, preaching, and, and liberating people. So I believe as a church, the body of Christ, we are called to continue this work of mercy. Now as I read about millennials and what they are looking for, that millennials as a group, they have a compassionate spirit. That are young people, they want to make a difference in the world. They want to make the world a better place. And isn't that what Jesus calls the church to do? To make this world a better place. So I think when the church is serving and sharing and caring, when we're doing those things, that I think our young people will notice and will want to be a part of this movement we call the Christian church. Now I've said it before, and I always say it, that one of the best ways to connect non-religious and nominally religious people to the church is to invite them to join us on a mission or an outreach project. That if you invite them to come to church, they'll be a little leery. I don't know about that. But say, hey, we're doing this thing down in Detroit or up in Pontiac. Can you, you want to come and join me? Many times they'll say, yes, I, I can get along with that. And when they're working shoulder to shoulder, side by side with other Christians, they'll see that we're normal folks. <laughs> we're not strange but we're caring and we want to make the world a better place and maybe just maybe they might be interested in exploring this Catholic church. Now let me say a few words about that. Now I remember growing up as a kid, we re recite the Apostles' Creed. And I always remember coming to that time where it says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And I would think in my mind, wait a second, we're not Catholic, we're Methodists. Why are we believing in the Catholic Church? But it was only when I was in confirmation that I learned Catholic with a small case C meant universal. That Catholic meant all churches. That we're all part of the Catholic church. So no matter how big we are or how small we are, whether we're a part of a denomination or we're an independent, we're all part of the Catholic church. Thus, as Adam Hamilton says, there's Roman Catholic, there's Methodist Catholic, there's Baptist Catholic. We're all Catholic churches. So no matter where we go in the world, if we enter into a Christian church, we, you and I, will connect to the body of Christ. Whether it's in Ohio, Florida, California, it's in India, it's in Australia, wherever we are, we're connected to the body and we'll be in the communion of the saints. And just as I showed, there's connections and connotations to the word holy. There's also connotations to the word communion of saints there in the Apostles' Creed. Because when we think of communion, again, what comes to our mind? Well, we do on the first Sunday of the month, right? We have the body and bread of Christ. That's communion. And that's one way to interpret that word. But in a fuller sense, communion is 
representative of, of a wider fellowship. Communion and, and community come from the same Latin base word. So that helps you. So communion is tied to community. And the way we exemplify that is especially on World Communion Sunday, right? The first Sunday of October every year, we recognize that not only when we commune, we're connected to Christ through these sacraments, but we're also connected to Christians around the world. There's a, a greater fellowship, if you will, than just those in this sanctuary that receive Holy Communion. Though it's ironic that one month after we celebrate World Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in October, the first Sunday in November, we recognize All Saints Sunday. Now, in that context, we recognize the saints as those persons who have deceased the past year. And we remember and honor those persons as part of our church service. But there's another context, another way we understand the word saint, and that is those people that have gone above and beyond in serving God. We think of the Mother Teresa's of the world. Those are the saints, right? Well, if you read your Bible, in that interpretation, saint is a Christian, that we're all saints. In fact, if you read through the letters of Paul, he begins his letters basically saying to the saints of Ephesus, to the saints of Corinth. He's not addressing a unique group of people that are super religious. He's saying we're all saints. Thus to say we believe in the community of saints, the communion of saints, we're affirming the importance of being together with other Christians. That Jesus said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, so I am there also. We're affirming that we believe in the importance of being together, communing with other saints. Now, it's interesting, that connection that we have with the saints, and Adam Hamilton brings it up in his book, Creed, that maybe, just maybe, when we worship together, we're not just connecting with those around us and Christ, that maybe in our worship experience, we might even be able to connect, relate to those who have gone on before us. Because he writes about this, this thin space. And the thin spaces in the world are those places where heaven and earth seem to come together. That there's times and places where we seem almost connected with those before us, with us, and even ahead of us. And so maybe in worship, when we praise God, we can be and experience the presence of those people that have gone on before us. So, for example, the, the, on All Saints Sunday, one of the scripture lessons we often read is from Hebrews. Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is before us. But maybe those saints aren't just out there looking down at us. Maybe in some way those saints are present with us in our spirit and our soul as we worship together. So friends, we live in a tough time for the church. We live in a time where more and more people are claiming to be nuns or duns when it comes with church affiliation. And those persons who belong to the church, they don't come to worship as often as they normally would. So it's impacting the church. But I know I've, commit, I've committed my life to serving the church. I believe in the church as a body of Christ and the difference the church can make to not only to the community, to the world, but those people that are part of the church. But we have work to do. But I believe that if we're passionate about what the church at its best can do, and if we're open to changes and how this Holy Spirit might be leading us, not just Franklin Community Church, but all the churches, then we will have a future. Because we just need to, again, look at Jesus commissioning Peter, on this rock I will build my ecclesia. That Jesus knew that there was a purpose for ministry in the world. That's why he created the church. And what it looks like now may not be what it will look like in the future. But I strongly believe that God will continue to have some organization in the world called the church. And hopefully we'll be a part of that as we move forward. So let us pray. So, gracious Lord, we've looked at the Apostles' Creed now, that part of, I believe, in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. 
And many of us have been part of a church almost all of our lives. And we receive nurture and support through this body of Christ. But we also know the good that the church has done over the years, whether it's through mission work or starting schools or hospitals, just so many things. But we also acknowledge that this church is is slowly, not maybe dying, but slowly getting smaller and smaller. And we're concerned about that. But blow into us your Holy Spirit. Revive us. Lead us into being the ecclesia that you want us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I thought since we were talking about the communion of saints, that to close our worship service, we'd sing about the saints. Not just the saints that have gone before us, but some of us saints. We're still trying to make a difference in the world today. So I invite us to stand and sing our closing hymn. Rejoice in God's saints. reminder there's certainly plenty of food for us to enjoy in our fellowship time and if you'd like to make a contribution to hungry for music that opportunity is before us but it's a beautiful day a beautiful week before us and hopefully we'll find opportunities to worship and praise god and next week we'll look at the forgiveness of sins and what that means in the apostles creed so friends may the peace of god which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the love and knowledge of god the almighty and may the blessings of God be with us and sustain us this day and every day. Amen.